The lesson from the Word today comes from Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 21. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public great disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins." May the Lord bless the reading of his word today. Today is the second Sunday of Advent, and it's a season within the church that will take us all the way up through Christmas Eve. The intent of Advent is to prepare for and anticipate the coming of the Christ by reflecting on the birth of Jesus back then and his second coming in the future. We remember how the Jewish people looked for their Messiah to appear that was long promised and how we now look for him to return. It is a time of both looking back and looking forward and it is all centered on Jesus, the one who came to us and the one who will come again for us. And so over the next few weeks, we're going to look at Jesus through the, this, this handful of names that the scriptures give him, namely King, Savior, Emmanuel, Word, and Lord. Our focus this Advent season will be on the incarnation. Incarnation means to embody or to become flesh. And as we will see, God himself came and inhabited human flesh in the person of Jesus Christ. He actually became flesh and blood. He actually became totally and completely human. And he also came to embody these names that we're looking at. King, Savior, Emmanuel, Word, and Lord. Last Sunday, we began with his name, King. And we also looked at those names that go along with that, namely uh, Messiah and Christ. And we confessed that we needed this King to come, just as generations of people long before us had been waiting and needing him to come. He was the King who was God incarnate, just as we needed him to be. But also we need him to come again, to come again and to rule totally and completely. And someday he will indeed come again. And in the meantime, we're going to continue to make him the king of our lives while we wait for him to come and complete his restorative work. And so now today we're going to look at another name for Jesus, and that name is Savior. And that name ties closely to his actual given name of Jesus. In our passage for today from Matthew chapter 1, we see how his birth came to be as well as how he got his name. It says that his mother Mary had been pledged to, to uh, be married to Joseph, but she was discovered to be pregnant before they ever came together. And she was pregnant by the work of the Holy Spirit. And assuming that Mary had been unfaithful to him, Joseph decided he was going to divorce her quietly, which prompted God to send an angel to Joseph in a dream. And that angel laid it straight for him, starting in about verse 20, where he tells him, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. You see, the name Jesus is an English language translation of the Greek form of the Lord's name in Hebrew. In Hebrew, his name is Yeshua, which is shortened from the name Yehoshua. The first part of the name is from God's own name, Yahweh, and the second part is from the Hebrew word that means to save. So therefore, the name Jesus literally means God saves. His name literally tells us who he is, why he came, and what he came to do. As the angel told Joseph, you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Jesus is our Savior, just as his name means Savior. So what does he save us from? Well, first, of course, he saves us from what the angel tells Joseph that he's coming to save us from, and that is our sins. Bottom line is, we are all sinners. Does anyone want to contest that today? We're all sinners. Romans 3.23 tells us as much when it says, for all have sinned 
and, have, and fall short of the glory of God. We are sinners in need of saving from our sins. All those times that we didn't do the right thing, all those times we did the wrong thing, where we fail to love God and we fail to love others, we've strayed from the path, we've missed the mark. So many times can any of us begin to count? And when we do sin, how do we feel? We feel rotten, right? We feel lost. We feel disconnected. We feel alienated. We feel racked with guilt and shame. We are sinners. And because we are sinners, we are far from the God who created us. But guess what? God loves us. And Jesus is our confirmation of this fact. As it says in Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We are indeed sinners, but God loves us in spite of that. And the good news is that Jesus came to remedy this. We are sinners. And this is something that we cannot save ourselves from. It required a savior. And not just any savior. It required this savior. This one who was God incarnate, God in the flesh. He had to be God in the flesh because only God can forgive us of our sins. In fact, it says as much of Jesus in Mark 2, verse 7. Someone says to him, one of the teachers of the law says, why does this, why does this fellow talk like that? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Indeed, God alone. Jesus as Savior forgives us of our sins, saves us from them, and saves us from the separation from God that results from them. But you see, Jesus saves us from more than just our sins. He saves us from death, too. Death is that thing that none of us can escape. I mean, we can't even stop ourselves from sinning. So how do you think it goes with dying? The wages of sin is death, Romans 6, 23 says. Without Jesus, we would die in our sins as that is the consequence of our sins. But, but Jesus saves us from death too. And his resurrection from the dead is our assurance of that fact, of complete and total victory over death, his death as well as our death. In John eleven twenty five, 25, Jesus said this. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me shall never die. And so if we make this Jesus our Savior, living by believing in him, believing in, in the fact that he alone offers us salvation, saving us from our sins when we confess them to Him and ask for His forgiveness, if we believe that this Savior who literally lived with humanity and then on a cross died for humanity and then rose again on the third day for humanity's sake, then when it's our turn to die, we will still live on in His presence forever. We will be saved from death. But there's even more. As if those two things weren't enough. But even beyond being saved from sin and death, Jesus saves us from hopelessness and lovelessness and despair. And that goes along with what we're remembering this Advent season, that literally God came near. He came to us in Jesus, in the flesh, the literal embodiment of God, and also the literal embodiment of hope and love and peace. Because of our Savior, we do not live in hopelessness because He Himself is our hope. He gives us hope. Because of our Savior, we know we are loved, right? Because God gave us His only Son because He loved us that much. No matter how unloved we may feel by those around us or, or even by ourselves, we do not go unloved because our Savior loves us. He loved us to the cross and to the grave and back again. And because we have a Savior, we do not live in despair or fear. And I mention this again because it's that important. Because the world has a tendency to beat every last bit of hope out of us. But we don't live like that. Because we have a Savior who gives us peace. We have a Savior whose 
One of his other names, I'm not covering it, but it's a name for him, is our Prince of Peace. He gives us peace because he has complete and total control over our hope. He gives us his peace, as he says in John 14, 27. He said, peace I leave you, my peace I give you, I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. We have peace because we have this Savior, right? Who saves us totally and completely, amen. And here's the thing, here's the thing. We are saved for a purpose. By this Savior who is God in the flesh, the embodiment of God himself, we are saved from our sins and saved from death and we're saved from hopelessness and the lovelessness and despair and all of it is for a reason and it's to embody ourselves, for us to embody God's forgiveness in our own lives. It's to embody God's life in our own lives. It's to embody God's hopefulness in our own lives. It's to embody God's love in our own lives and to do what we can to rescue others from lives of despair as well. But before we can take up these marching orders, let me ask you this. Do you need a Savior? Because how you answer that says everything about what Jesus means to you. Do you need a savior? And has Jesus saved you? Is he still in the process of saving you? And what is it that you need saved from? Again, this Advent series, we're looking at the incarnation through the names for Jesus. So today we're going to name it. Whatever it is that you need saving from today, we are going to name that. We're going to go here into prayer and I'm going to give you a, a, some time to silently name those things that you need saved from in your hearts and in your minds. We are going to name what we need Jesus, our Savior, to save us from, to deliver us from. We're going to name all of it. And then we're going to give it up in the name of the incarnate one who saves so that we can go out then and be living expressions of the one who is our Savior. So please now, if you would, pray with me these words and make them your own in your mind and in your heart. Let us pray. Dear Jesus, we come to you today in need of a Savior, and maybe for some this is a prayer reclaiming what we did long ago when we asked you to be our Savior. Or maybe it's a prayer where for the first time we're asking you to be our Savior. But whatever it is, Lord, hear these words as my own. Jesus, I need you to be my Savior. I am a sinner. And I need you to forgive every last one of my sins. And save me from them. And I need you to save me from death. And I believe in my heart that you can. You who died for my sins on a cross and on the third day rose again, you lived and you died and you live forevermore. And because of that, I can too. And Jesus, I need you to save me from hopelessness and lovelessness and despair. And specifically, Jesus, I need you to save me from these things that I give over to you in these moments of silence. Jesus, you are my king. And now I need you to be 
my Savior. In faith, in trust, I name you as my Savior. And it's in your name of Jesus, the only name by which we are saved, I pray these things. Amen.